Uh, April 10th. Hey, Clint, buddy, you're muted, my friend. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is going much better than a uh, Zoom um, that I did last week where I thought it was a technical issue, but I actually had the camera covered. I didn't even know these things came with a little camera cover. So I am right on top of technology uh, here with that. Uh, thank you guys for having me uh, this evening. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, participate in the series. I really like District 1 and all the counties that are involved and uh, uh, the opportunity to follow Keith uh, is uh, kind of a real honor to, to get to do that. He, he does an awful lot of this work and is, is very, very good. I, I think Keith may be watching tonight and uh, I made some notes last week while he was speaking. One of the notes, um, Keith kind of remarked that uh, with COVID, he had lost 20 pounds. And I would like to tell Keith that during COVID, I, I have found them. Uh, so I've, I've kind of picked up everything that uh, he put down. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the basics of estate planning and uh, mostly the concept of just getting started. Uh, like a lot of things in life, you read about things, you attend seminars or UK events or something like tonight. And that is great. That is absolutely wonderful to have the background, the educational materials uh, available to you. But the real movement begins the when you commit to it, when you actually start uh, with doing something. Uh, that's, a, that's a really big step and a lot of people put that off for a very long time uh, and then feel overwhelmed by the process once they're in a hurry or in a rush uh, to do that. Uh, have done several of these planning uh, estate basic talks. Uh, Jennifer Hunter and I with UK had rounds of them and then uh, Steve Isaacs before her. And with the questions <clears throat> that April was gonna help or assist with putting in the chat, I can tell you as an attorney, you, after a long time, you develop list of things that, that either little pet peeves or, or things that people say that, that grip you a little bit that um, <clears throat> that that really kind of give you a, a, an insight to the human condition or mindset and that's a lot of the time what attorneys have and deal with uh, with their clients but one of my favorite things is attending these seminars I get lots of hands raised and they always preface whatever they're about to ask with well, Mr. Quarles, if I die, and then they start and go on to answer the question. And I've always thought, what, what are you thinking is the backup to that? What, what alternative are you, do you have in your head to dying? You are going to die. Uh, everybody uh, has a, a natural uh, expiration point, whether it's planned or unplanned, sudden or anticipated. Uh, all of us are going to pass away. So that is one thing that I've always found very curious that people are sometimes um, not as willing to talk about their own mortality and planning for that. And in my mind, as an attorney or just a prudent person, you've always got to think, uh, you know, that is something that is absolutely inevitable that will happen to every one of us. And so making the choice or the decisions to get started planning um, is just just part of uh, uh, just part of life. I'm pretty sure there's a phrase or an expression in there about uh, taxes uh, there as well. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about the basics of estate planning and I've got a little slideshow and I don't have graphics or all the cool pictures and things like that but I do have things that are that are written down and we'll be emailing this stuff in a PDF 
format to, to April or to Philip or, or whoever, uh, if you all want some of these things uh, to do. But really tonight is about thoughts that lead to planning, that lead to getting down, the taking the first few steps towards the road or the treadmill is one way I like to think about it, uh, of estate planning. So I think I'm gonna hit share screen and it should, yep, uh, is that working, Philip, in April? Yes, sir. All right, basics of estate planning. So I've already talked about the, the concept of if I die. Well, let's just assume for everybody that you will. Here are some of the considerations that I've put together that I think you may like. Well, number one, if I died of boredom during this presentation, and some of you may, what would happen to my property? That's a, that's a very real concern. What if you were, you or your spouse, or you and your business partners, um, and if not partners, then um, uh, key employees, uh, people that are, that are invested in the business or have equity stakes, what if any one of you got in a car tonight and didn't make it home? Or uh, a medical condition, a heart attack, a stroke, in number three there, left you inca incapacitated or left your uh, spouse or business partner incapacitated. Guys, this is, this stuff is very real. And from an attorney standpoint, we always talk about this mythical person called the reasonably prudent person. That is essentially how you're supposed to act at all times to, uh, to avoid negligence, claims, liability uh, for, for malfeasance. Uh, but thinking about your own mortality and planning for that and thinking about, well, you know, we are in a business endeavor together, whether that be a, a business of uh, farming or uh, some, something in the agriculture field or not, uh, what if my business partner dies? And then a lot of people fail to plan for a spouse dying and think about it in terms of a business plan there as well. Uh, you're probably your business, biggest business partner, uh, both in life, uh, at home and, and on the farm or in your uh, business it is your spouse or your partner for life. And a lot of people don't think about the business implications of losing uh, that person. Second or third and fourth thing there uh, is incapacitation. And Keith talked about that last time. And that's really <clears throat> a little bit morbid to think about, but being, becoming incapacitated or needing to slow down medically uh, at the end of life is something that happens to a, a great number of people. I, I think a lot of us have that goal in mind of going to sleep and, you know, waking up and you were fine. You know, that's, that's how a lot of us would like to go out. However, I think the reality for a lot of people, when you look around <clears throat> members of your own family, has been that you become incapacitated either physically uh, towards the end or you become incapacitated to some degree or another mentally uh, before the end, and sometimes both, and sometimes uh, you lose mobility or you lose mental faculties long before your end, and that's something to think about and plan for. Uh, the plan, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. What kind of a estate plan are we talking about? A plan really is more than just a will that a will is part of one of the tools in the toolbox, but we want to do more than that. You wanna you want to do more than just a will. You wanna plan a complete uh, way to address end of life 
and care. Uh, the plan is the distribution of assets and resources, property uh, at the end or during a crisis, uh, and then during a crisis that will have uh, maybe an unknown time period before the end of your life. Uh, the plan, in my mind, should provide for orderly transfer of that property. And it doesn't always have to be a death. I think Keith did a wonderful job last week touching on the fact that you can start divesting yourself of property uh, well before you pass away. And I really, really like that as an attorney. I, I think that that means so much more when you can give the gift and see the uh, the thrill on, on somebody's face. Uh, agriculture is a weird, weird place sometimes, and, and farmers are even weirder. Uh, you know, I, I think all of us have fathers or grandfathers that have pieces of equipment that uh, if, if given to us, you'd have to fake a smile uh, when they're given. I've, I've got a hay baler and a hay rake that if my dad were to uh, give those things to me, I, I think I would push them off a cliff uh, immediately. And that would bring, bring joy to me at that point. And everybody has something like that, uh, I think, in their, their life. But short of the things that you don't want, the things that you do might come with a story that you haven't heard before. It might come with a memory in passing that on that is, is more than the object itself. And I, I really like uh, giving things while you're still alive. Third there uh, gets back to my uh, treadmill example that I talked about a moment ago. Once you create a plan on one of these things, you are not done. Once you do the effort to create a plan, let's say that maybe most of the work is done, but that is something that needs to be changed and updated on a regular basis because your life changes and may need to be updated on a regular basis uh, just to reflect your, your current reality at the time more things, less things, uh, more kids, more grandkids, sometimes less kids, less grandkids, uh, that kind of stuff. You, you want to, to review the thing that you've put in work on uh, pretty regularly um, after you create it. The part of what Keith uh, touched on last week is something that I wanna come back again today to tell you about. I do make a joke pretty often that maybe the easiest way to plan for your estate uh, after you die is to simply not have one. Uh, a lot of people um, don't contemplate uh, the, the risks that they have in maintaining the assets, cash reserves, and property that they have towards the end of life. Uh, it, you know, we're all causing one car accident away from potentially putting a lot of that stuff at risk, but we have a lot of other care uh, at the end of life or towards the end of life, medical bills, hospital bills, nursing home bills uh, that we may face in an era or time period where we may not have the full benefits of medical insurance like we did when we were actively working uh, uh, or working full time. Uh, the whole goal uh, for everyone here is to pass away with, with assets that far exceed the amount of money that you may owe anybody. And that's what we're talking about passing on. So your, your estate uh, really is the, the net amount uh, after, after you pass away. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is uh, the richest person on the planet, Jeff Bezos, he will die owing money. E every single person on the face of the planet will die owing money, regardless of your number of assets, because you always have that next cell phone bill that was due, the next water bill, things like that. And that's what we have the probate process for, is to get all of that stuff cleared up. And we, we're passing assets that don't have... Uh, leads and things like that against them if possible. 
the, the government of Kentucky has figured out or created a scheme for what happens to your stuff when you die without a will in Kentucky. And the, what we're looking at when we look at the screen is just imagine you are in the very first box in the middle of the, um, uh, in, in the middle of the screen there at the very top. So let's say that you are the d deceased person and you are, you are dying with a uh, surviving spouse. So we're gonna start there uh, in terms of analysis, just so we can have a, a quick uh, glance at what things look like if some of you were to pass away tonight and you had not gotten to the point of creating uh, that valid will. Let's say that you, um, uh, let's say that you pass away and your spouse is still living. Let's talk about the, the definition of a spouse uh, there for a moment, because uh, I do get some pretty creative questions about that. Uh, Kentucky is not a common law marriage state. So uh, when, you, when we say you, you are dying with a spouse, you are uh, dying with somebody that you have a piece of paper that says you guys were married at that time. Uh, the number of years perhaps that you uh, lived with somebody or to use the, the parlance of some of my students at UK that you, you shacked up with, those years don't count. Uh, you, you, it's just a function of dying uh, with being married. So then we'll take the left-hand side of the screen and kind of make a division point down the middle. I need to draw that out a little better. Let's say that you did uh, pass away with surviving children. Uh, and we'll take myself as an example. I have two children. Uh, one is eight and one is uh, 10 years old. Uh, my 10 year old came home with a note today that he was misbehaving at school. So I, I have not showed that note to his mother. I might only have one surviving child uh, by the end of the evening when she reads it. But for now I have two surviving children and a spouse. In Kentucky, your surviving spouse uh, gets some money off the top. And, and you'll see this in the state planning documents. But essentially, they, the General Assembly uh, recently modified this. Uh, if you're looking at kind of older things that were on the internet or uh, maybe some older publications from the university, uh, very recently that was increased from fifteen dollars to $30,000. So we're going to say that the entire state, whatever it is, the first 30,000 goes to the surviving spouse. After that, one half of the assets are passed to the surviving spouse and one half, the remaining half, are divided equally among the children. So in my case, uh, let's say I, I had $100 left in the estate after I passed away and my surviving spouse um, collected possibly up to her $30,000. Uh, my surviving spouse would receive $50. Uh, child number one would receive $25 and child number two would take the other $25. Uh, if there were three children, we start doing math, uh, they would each receive one sixth of that money and surviving spouse uh, will always collect the half. If you have children that have predeceased you, their decedents step into the place of the child that passed away. So uh, let's say that my son uh, did have, let's say, uh, two children. Uh, the two children, if my son passed away under that scheme, uh, would each in, uh, be given $12.50. So they would split their uh, father's one fourth. Uh, this is called per stirpes or by the stocks uh, from Latin, meaning all of this moves as a degree of uh, blood relation to you. And a lot of this stuff is, is uh, modern 
culmination of very ancient law. On the right hand side of the screen, let's say that my uh, spouse and I had no children. Uh, and in this scenario, we, we need to be very specific because my spouse could have had a child, um, um, maybe, well, we would hope after or, or before we got married. Um, but if that child is not my child and I've not gone through the process of a legal adoption and I die with no children, uh, my surviving spouse would still receive after uh, up to the $30,000, she would still receive one half of the estate. And then instead of going downward, if we're thinking about uh, a family tree, we're going to go back upward in that each of my parents would receive the, the rest of the one half, but divided equally. One half would go to my father and one half would um, go to my mother. And then beyond that, we start searching for people that are still alive if parents have predeceased you. Um, April and Philip, do we want to stop and do questions at this point on uh, dying without a will? Because we've, we've done the one with a surviving spouse. Maybe we'll do things with dying in test aid or without a will uh, in just a moment after we do the the next side, which is uh, dying uh, with no spouse and no will. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have surviving children. So you you have passed away. You do not have a surviving spouse, but you do have surviving children. In that situation, the children divide the state uh, the estate equally. So in my scenario, one child would receive fifty percent and the other child would receive 50%. Uh, if they had predeceased me, those grandchildren or possibly even great-grandchildren uh, of mine step into the decedent's shoes. If we die with no children and no spouse, we again go back up the tree and it is uh, divided equally among both lines for the parent, uh, equally one half would go to essentially the mom's side, the other half would go to the dad's side. If no parents, we go to brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. Uh, if we don't have any questions right now, let's talk about what stops us from estate planning. And like a lot of things in life, People don't do it because it's tough. Uh, people don't do it because it's tough to get started. And I'm of the firm opinion that people don't start estate planning because they feel very uncomfortable about talking about death. Uh, they feel very uncomfortable talking about their own death or they feel uncomfortable about uh, discussing how they'd like to uh, settle or distribute things uh, among children or because uh, there is some conflict that has been involved, maybe conflicts that are ongoing, where parents have to make some pretty tough decisions uh, when it comes to that fair versus equitable uh, discussion that Keith mentioned last week. Uh, some things that I've that I've heard um, in doing talks, uh, state planning is only needed by the elderly and wealthy. I simply don't believe that. Uh, I think uh, state planning is something that everyone needs. Uh, I think if you, if you don't like those slides that we just saw about splitting things, then you know a will uh, is the right tool for you. Uh, other times I've heard that estate planning ends with a simple will. You just write one will and you're done. Uh, number three, I've heard, you know, the state has laws to perfect, to do my estate. They, they like intestacy um, and they choose not to go forward. Some people in number four have joint ownership uh, as a 
substitution for uh, state planning and joint subs or joint ownership there. And Keith's going to get into this uh, in the next session. Uh, sometimes we can title assets or hold assets in a manner that both of us own it and the surviving one of the two of us takes everything. Uh, when the first one dies, everything goes to the second one. It's really common with bank accounts. Uh, you, you can own real estate like that, and it's a pretty efficient way uh, to own some things like that uh, that do not expose it to the probate process. Uh, joint ownership of some uh, bank accounts and things like that is uh, are pretty nice things to have uh, right at the time of death because it, it, it has cash uh, available to you and it's freed up and it doesn't need to go through the probate process. And then the last one people fear uh, is that estate planning is, is too expensive. I, I'm also not a, not a fan of that statement either because uh, if, it's, if it's worth it to you, and it would give you peace of mind to see your assets go where you want them to, paying a, a small fee to ensure that, or paying a small fee to ensure that peace of mind, in my mind, is very, very important. So we've knocked down the stop sign, and meaning we are absolutely gonna go. We're gonna go forward, and we're gonna start with the estate planning process. So what do we need to do? This is the uh, the wheel or the treadmill that I was talking about before. Uh, this is very, very, very analogous to farming uh, in that once you get started, you, you do this until you die. Uh, a lot of farmers, I mean, I'd like a day or two off at the end. That'd be pretty nice. Uh, but a whole lot of us uh, kind of realize that even cyclical things in life in the, over the course of the, the very long horizon, the time off is just time to prep for the next cycle. I, I really think that about estate planning, the biggest bunch of estate planning is organizing and preparing. Uh, at the middle of this, really at the heart of it, is the work that you do needs to be communicated to somebody else. And of course, if you are jointly planning uh, estates and their distributions with uh, your spouse, they, they will be aware, but I'm also a giant fan of sitting, let's say the kids down while everyone is still alive and discussing what a will and its contents or a will that would might create a trust, things called a testamentary trust that Keith will get over. Tell them while everyone is still alive. And the reason that I'm saying that is that I am very sure that everybody listening can <clears throat> think about that example where, you know, that the family was was pretty okay until the one of the pillars passed away. And then there was a colossal amount of fighting after mom or dad died. Uh, that is something that I, I see in my practice. I don't know if I see it every day, but I, I see it uh, weekly where uh, siblings don't talk to one another anymore. Cousins uh, uh, are pretty upset over how grandma or grandpa uh, set something up and if you can communicate some of your desires and you can communicate wishes during your lifetime number one uh, if it's a decision that you didn't like sometimes that's an easier pill to swallow if you heard mom or dad tell you this is how i want it uh, i think a lot of the arguing and bickering among relatives goes away when everybody heard mom or dad speak the words that this is how I wanted it. The backup to that is if you have a situation, maybe you didn't even understand how important an object or a, an asset or family heirloom was to one child over another and the kids or one of the kids are 
visually upset that in your will you are planning to leave it to, to one person as opposed to another, uh, if there is something like that that comes about, well, you have a chance to, to fix that. You have a chance to go back and alter what you have written and that is part of the organization and preparing, you can alter the document that you've created and award one thing to a, to a child that really, really wanted it. And you can help avoid those type of conflicts if you know about it. But once, you, once you're gone, you really can't come back and fix uh, anything. Uh, when, when we're getting started, these are kind of the basic steps that you have. We're going to come back to other slides that kind of look like these, but these are the, this is kind of the highlight or the uh, overview on this. Um, in planning, and these are, these are uh, things that I, I'm going to say what it is, and then I'm going to say what it really means. Uh, so I really like it, you know, kind of pre-Zoom and, and pre-COVID when I could look around at, at sometimes the couples that would come in the room and uh, leaving them uh, or seeing them filing out and the one of the spouses I can visually see is going to have a big talk with the other spouse on the way home uh, and if you're in a situation like that and I can't see you guys but you can look over at your spouse and start raising an eyebrow right now and here's a good one to do it. Uh, number one, do you know what you have? And then number two, do you know where it is? Uh, I am 40, I'm staring 42 in the face. Uh, frequently, I think I have things that I do not. I've uh, used them or sold them or something like that. And then number two, I am increasingly getting to the point in life where I probably have a lot of these things and simply can't find them anymore. I know that I have it. Uh, I, I just can't find where it is. Generally around planting season for me, I'll, I'll stock up on uh, consumable items that I know that I've bought. I can't find them. I'll go back to the store and buy some more. And uh, sometimes I'll do repeat that process two or three times, and it's only at the end of the year when I'm putting things away and taking inventory for the next year that I find where I've put everything. Life is a lot like that. Uh, now, things like land, it's pretty hard to lose track of where a farm is. Um, so I'm not talking about things like your house, uh, maybe a vacation property, a farm, the farm you grew up on, mom or dad's place. But what do you own can be a little more complicated um, on its face in real property if you own a fractionary interest in something. And have you communicated that uh, to your spouse? Did, or, you know, great granddad's farm, you might have, I've seen, seen it where uh, somebody owns a 12 or 15 percent interest or something like that in the farm and it's just something that their cousins have had and, and had maybe even a majority ownership interest in and they've never in their life thought about communicating that uh, to the to the next generation or through other terms of intestacy uh, that happened a long time ago it's a it's only a sliver of something, but they've never thought about passing that on. Uh, real estate is very different than uh, personal items. And in farming, that gets far, far, far more complicated. What do you own as a farmer? And do you know where it is? Uh, Philip Knopke and I both uh, have an addiction to collecting antique tractors. Uh, Philip will, will be very quick to point out that I'm an Alice Chalmers fan and I collect antique Alice Chalmers. Uh, Philip Kanopka is a John Deere fan and cl collects antique John Deere's. It's just that John Deere's kept making obsolete and antique tractors uh, well into the, the 60s. So he's, you know, they're not as old as the things that I like to collect. Um, 
at one point I was thinking that I, I had a hoarding problem with this. And now I have John Deere tractors, or I'm sorry, I have my Alice Chalmers tractors spread over several farms. Uh, they're not in a position where my spouse can see more than two or three of them from any given vantage point. I really think that that is a key to happy marriages is to not let too much junk uh, accumulate at least from one vantage point. Uh, you can you can always say that that was the same tractor that you just moved it in case you really get called on the carpet. What about the other things that we own? As farmers, you typically help neighbors out. You loan things out. Uh, you let people borrow things. And the converse to that is you have borrowed things or you've used something and not uh, taken it back. Uh, I have had uh, things where at any given point in the year, uh, five or six of my wagons may not be on my property. I've, I've loaned them out uh, to other people. Uh, there are tillage tools and equipment that, that I've borrowed from a couple of my friends in Scott County. And I have asked several times to bring them back. When can I do that? And they have told me, well, just keep it. I'll come up there when I get it. And it's, you know, they don't want the clutter at their place. But the thing that is sitting um, in my fence row or around my shop does not belong to me. Uh, as the, the primary farmer and decision maker in my spouse's and I's operation, uh, if I passed away, I would, my spouse would struggle to find a record of the things that are on my property that I don't own. And conversely, I don't know that she would uh, know necessarily who has my wagons or tillage equipment or whatever else it is that may not be there. So the things that you own are things that maybe you ought to uh, keep current lists on. And we'll get into those lists uh, here in a few minutes. Uh, the second one, uh, this is kind of meeting season for Kentucky agriculture. And in meeting season, part of that, uh, if you're a farmer like I, and, and that require operating loans from farm credit, ag credit, your local bank, uh, this is the time of year when you are reviewing uh, your uh, net worth statements, because I, I need to prove to my bankers every year that I am a good, good person to loan money to, because I more than likely will pay it back. If you have eclipsed this point in your life where you uh, are not needing to borrow operating money and things like that, uh, you might not have recently had any cause to write down everything that you own or to create a, a, a balance sheet or a net worth statement. I think a lot of people, once they get to that position in life where they're not borrowing uh, or seeking out a lender for an operating note, give that about 10 years and I think you're going to be shocked at how much your net worth is, uh, is particularly in today's kind of inflationary environment uh, when, when it comes to farm equipment, land prices, and everything else. Uh, I was reviewing my uh, equipment list uh, a few minutes ago before the Zoom call, because uh, that's part of the, the net worth statement that I've got to come up with. And while I think I was being very honest with myself four or five years ago in my equipment list, there's no way that I could buy that equipment today at an auction for what I had it listed for then. Uh, some of the things, particularly older pieces of equipment that I don't want to sell, but they're I mean, they're pretty well junk. Some of those things have doubled, if not tripled in value. Uh, I haven't done anything different, but, but because of the kind of in, environment that we're in uh, economically, a lot of that stuff is shot up in value. And if that is part of your decision-making and your decision uh, tree that you or your spouse are gonna come up with in planning, uh, maybe that the kids split the land and 
and maybe you have a different idea for the equipment. Well, now the equipment may be worth far, far more uh, than what you had thought before, and that might get, get back into your fair versus equitable statement. But your net worth is something that uh, maybe annually you can sit down and figure and be honest with yourself uh, when you do that, whether it's cars, trucks, uh, the stock market, bonds, cash that you have hoarded in different places in your house. Uh, that was a favorite of my grandparents was, you know, just they, they grew up in the depression and socking away cash was something. Is this, are these things that you have done that you uh, need to update your net worth statement on? Number three, or, or number one, sub C rather, where are your important papers? So once you create these lists, um, everybody should have an important paper location and communicate that to somebody else. Uh, if you're anything like the Quarles household going, growing up, there could be several secret locations uh, of all of the important papers. Um, it, it frequently looked like a bomb or some sort of device that exploded in my dad's office, uh, but a lot of people uh, have the papers, they're just not filed orderly and they're not placed in, a, in one centralized location. Maybe the mastermind or the person that put them together knows where everything is, but unless that's communicated, uh, when that per person passes on, that um, filing system and the logic behind it uh, frequently uh, goes with them. So we're gonna, gr we're gonna talk about uh, uh, methods for putting all of that stuff together. Number two, uh, have you really just sat and thought about more than, well, I need a will? Have you actually thought about what is the goal? What, what, what do I want to do uh, with this stuff? Uh, estate planning, again, is something that I kind of approach holistically. It's not just creating a will. It's, it's what is your purpose? What, what are your real desires in the assets? that you have? Have you thought about things that you would like? Have you communicated things like that? And then when you're putting together your estate planning team, do you have a written set of goals that you can pre present with them? Uh, those are things that, that are sometimes not discussed, but they're an outside of the box way to think about uh, how you'd like to tr your stuff to be treated at death. Um, there's different means of distribution. You have probate and um, uh, of wills or uh, things that were passed in intestacy. There's a couple of other things that uh, Keith's going to talk about. There are trusts. <clears throat> and then three, you've got uh, during your life gifts that are given away. If you kept a, a ledger or a, uh, some sort of document there, uh, particularly as you approach the uh, estate limits uh, and lifetime giving rules, have you kept a ledger of those things and kept it in, in a manner where your uh, estate planning team would be able to, to use the document to determine if people are meeting the thresholds that are applicable at your time of death? And again, generally speaking, you don't know when that is very far ahead of time. So some of those uh, uh, limits that Keith talked about last time, generally they've been increasing over time. I don't know that they will ever go in reverse, but just in case they do, uh, having that list of gifts will help determine uh, compliance on a date that you're not certain um, about when the date will be. You're, all you're certain about is that that day will come. Four, a plan is only an idea until you put it on paper. Once you get your plans together, we're gonna to prepare the, the documents. Uh, we're gonna talk about the things now that are other tools that you use that are uh, end of life things that a lot of people need, but they're a little bit different than a will. There are things that are that are used uh, prior to you passing away, and a couple of them are in the next line, is a durable power of attorney uh, or a power of attorney 
uh, medical directives that you might want at the, the end of life. You might have ideas about um, who you want to take care of you uh, or who you think would, would want to take care of you. And you need to write all of those things down. If you've got uh, in the end of 4C and then 4D, if you've got ideas about how you would like to be treated medically, a lot of people have very strong ideas about the decisions that will made that, that would be made that would affect their quality of life uh, at the very end. Uh, you talk about people that uh, reach a point where they will never regain consciousness or they will uh, need uh, machines to con continue living. Uh, there are documents that you can sign that will give your family uh, directives uh, to follow that will make sure that your wishes were um, uh, carried out. And these are things that you can think about now while you have absolute clarity of mind and get written down and executed. And then at the end of life, when you may not be in the, a position to articulate those desires, you've done it ahead of time. Uh, and then in number four, these things are becoming far, far more more popular uh, than they were even a few years ago when I started doing this with UK uh, is you can do you have uh, directives for how you'd like your your funeral to go to I, I've seen these that are um, prepaid funerals so you already know where you're going you know the cost you you uh, prepaid it and there's probably several farmers in the room that are thinking well I've you know I've prepaid fertilizer a few times that was a pretty good deal well you can go prepay a funeral if you feel like it uh, you can direct uh, viewing stuff and then uh, I think the modern trend is you pick music and the pictures that you would want played uh, maybe the outfit that you'd have on if you're going to have a, a, a viewing and a wake uh, you can plan out all of that stuff, and then it's yours. It was your creation, and you're not uh, necessarily trusting the thing, uh, your kids to pick out your clothes for you uh, there at the very end. Uh, going to the uh, going to the next one here, uh, establishing goals. Uh, things that you need to prepare for when you are coming up with the goal list. And I'm sorry, I'm uh, there. We go. Uh, you, you really do, if you're going to approach this holistically, you need to plan for mental and, and physical incapacity. Uh, just, just you could normally in a, in a in-person setting, you can do a show of hands and it's very, very rare that somebody in the room, particularly among a couple, that one of their parents or grandparents, if they were caring for them, but anybody in the room to not raise their hand when you talk about mom or dad at the very end uh, having at least a spell of mental or physical incapacity. Uh, we human beings uh, start breaking down and that is just something that's just about inevitable for most people. And if it's inevitable for most people statistically, don't think that you're the exception for the rule. Go on and plan for that thing, and you know maybe you'll get lucky on the other side. Uh, the next goal would be, how are we going to dispose of your possessions in a manner according uh, to your wishes? That's, that's one of the biggest things in creating a will, and a reason uh, for having a will is you get to, to pick who gets your stuff. Uh, sometimes that fair versus equ equitable, argument uh, comes up. Sometimes you have a child that is in dire need and the other one just simply doesn't need it. Sometimes people want land versus other things. You, you get to pick and you get to tailor things when you have a will. When you die without a will, the government is splitting things and your ability to plan um, ceased the moment that you did. Number three here, I should really should bump this up to the very top. If any of you are attending today and you have minor children, that is a major deal, is picking who you want to nominate 
to take care of, of the kids until they reach the age majority. I can tell you teaching at UK, um, uh, I, I think I've got one student uh, here on the list that's listening for sure, but it is wildly entertaining to watch the, the young couples that are in class uh, look at each other when I say right now, guys, if all of you all had a baby, and you passed away right now, whose mama do you want raising the kid? And, and just watching those fights take place is absolutely amazing uh, on that because of course everybody wants their mama raising, raising the grandbaby and uh, not saying that the other one, your, your potential spouses is any uh, better or worse, but you, you kind of know what you had. Uh, this one, uh, in modern times is something that's not as 1950s TV nuclear family as it once was. Uh, at one point, maybe even in my lifetime, uh, when I grew up, uh, you know, my parents' obligation ended really when I turned 18, and then they enjoyed, um, and, and my one that's living still enjoys being a grandparent, uh, you spoil them. And as uh, so many grandparents like to say, you spoil them and then you get to send them home. And that is absolutely wonderful. Now we're into 2022. Uh, there are lots of other realities of life. There's realities of rural life in rural Kentucky uh, and that now meet things that have gone on in maybe more urban areas for a long time. Uh, but now it is, it is very, very common for the grandparents to be raising the grandchildren. And it is very common for people that are maybe of uh, grandparent age to be the actual guardian that has been gone through the court process that are raising their grandbabies. They, they raise their children, something has happened to the children uh, drug use, incarceration, uh, sometimes military deployment, whatever those types of things may be. Uh, but, but the ability to, to appoint a guardian uh, is something that you do by a will. And you want to, when you do this, uh, you might have as a couple, when you're planning, kind of that one person that absolutely leaps out and you say, I would really want uh, Clint and Jackie to raise my minor kids, uh, but it doesn't stop there. You really need a, a, like a football style depth chart. What if Clint and Jackie are unavailable to raise the children? What if they have predeceased? What if they've moved uh, overseas? You need to have a backup plan and then a backup plan to the backup plan when you're talking about appointment of guardians for minor children. The rest of them here kind of all melt together. Uh, there are things that you can do, and Keith talked about that, or at least alluded to it last week, that you can minimize uh, some of the estate taxes uh, that may be due uh, if it's structured correctly. Uh, one goal that you really should think about is pro providing some sort of uh, a continuum plan or agreement uh, for either incapacitation or passing away if you are actively involved in a, in a farming operation or a business, uh, you, you need to at least give some thought to how that would work. Remember from the very first slide, we're not talking about just you. What if your business partner died? What, what if they died tomorrow? How have you planned on their death if now 50% of the workload uh, is not there to show up the next day, or it may be a hundred percent of the workload for one task. Maybe one uh, business partner was into the day-to-day -day physical operations, and the other one was more of the accounting, book side, sales, that kind of thing. Uh, what are you need a plan that is tailored for each person, um, and what you would do if one of those people passed. Uh, in the same thing with planning there, the next one down, uh, this is something that farmers are really bad at. Um, I mean, I'm a farmer and 
the land has been my wife and I's major asset. We've worked towards that in our house. Uh, I can't pay my grocery bill when I'm older with my house. I can't pay uh, medical bills with my house um, if I need to one day um, with my house or, or with the farm. I would need to convert those things into cash. And if those are things that I'd wish to pass on, I need to have some other kind of plan to take care of the costs and expenses that I inevitably will incur uh, for either retirement or uh, days when I when I do need things and cash is not necessarily liquid. And then the last one is I need to provide the family members information uh, that'll be useful in long-term planning. That includes getting your stuff together. And uh, if you're anything like uh, particularly my grandparents, uh, you need to put that stuff together and in a manner where it's coherent writing. Uh, I swear, I think in the 1950s and 60s, or maybe the 40s, 50s, and 60s, even how they made numbers was completely different. It's like look, learning a different language. Uh, when I've read that, they have to be in a, in a manner that somebody can read them. The things that you do need to put together are these lists that I'm talking about. Uh, I really like lists. I'm a list person. Uh, usually in life, you either really like lists or you really don't. And people that really like lists uh, tend to end up marrying people that really don't like lists. I'm such a list person that if, if it wasn't on my list and I did it on the farm that day, I leave space at the bottom, put it on the list, and then I can mark it out. Uh, that's just how my brain works. I really like that. Other people uh, have the capacity for mental lists, and I am not one of those. But when we start getting the list together, we're going to do property ownership. We're going to start putting things together about uh, where things are. If you're running uh, an, a farming operation on multiple farms or locations, that kind of list of where uh, is really important. Uh, also in the lists, and this is something that is not frequently written down because this is something that frequently uh, could spark uh, an entertaining debate among spouses is do you maintain a list of people you owe money to and do you also maintain that list of people that owe you money and this happens all the time in agriculture uh, I've got a couple neighbors that I uh, do things with but one neighbor down the road owes me for a load of corn. So it's, I think there was 700 and something bushels on that load, uh, $6 a bushel, that, that's a pretty healthy amount of change. It's more than $4,000 worth of, of um, income that I can have. And that is only in my head and that is only in his head. And I'm positive if I passed away uh, tomorrow that, that uh, the check would show up, but my spouse, would not be able to find that. Uh, conversely to that, if you have uh, rental property and things like that, uh, have you actually told your spouse how far behind one of your tenants are because the tenants are just really nice and you don't want to evict them and do anything else and COVID's going on. Uh, but have you written down those lists of, of uh, people or entities that owe you money and that you owe uh, money to them? Uh, in in that situation, uh, uh, you, you have to write that down. And the number two, you need to communicate that. Uh, second, uh, we, we've got that property ownership. That, that one's pretty easy. Uh, we're gonna put together wills uh, is one of the goals of the program, or at least think about them. You need to think about a power of attorney. That is somebody that acts as you while you are still alive. Uh, while you're still alive, uh, most of you are familiar with the power of attorney. Sometimes uh, these um, are very limited in, in nature. It's only for a specific task or a specific time period. Other times these are for a much broader uh, or undetermined time period. Uh, they have a couple different names, but basically a power of attorney is somebody is acting as you while you're alive. 
the moment that you pass away, the power of attorney uh, that, that either you hold over somebody else or they hold over you ceases. The power of attorney does not write a check 15 seconds after you die. They're not supposed to. Uh, uh, Keith really will get into the whole concept of probate. Um, the, it's probate historically has always been the time period where somebody um, uh, files some documents with the court and you, you essentially are putting the world on notice that somebody has, has passed away. And uh, really when you're doing that, it's not only a notice you know, to, to uh, make sure people know, but really what you're doing is saying, hey, everybody, look, if Clint Quarles owed you some money, uh, you need to get in touch with me so I can get you paid. Uh, that way I can kind of close out everything uh, that he had going at the end of his life. And that way I can make distributions uh, to his estate. That's what probate is in a nutshell. Uh, estate taxes and gifts or something else that Keith touched on and we'll get into further. And uh, lastly, trusts. Uh, I am a fan of trusts um, in certain situations. Uh, in other situations, uh, trusts can be a, a way for kind of the deceased person to maintain control after they die. Uh, some trusts are exceedingly complicated and leave some assets not as valuable as they were or uh, can even leave assets uh, unusable to some extent or the other uh, because of how a trust is written. So trusts are something that once you have that real well thought out goal is something that you do, do need to talk to uh, the attorney that you're going to pick one day. Uh, while it's possible to have a will without an attorney, uh, there are things called uh, holographic wills where you write it all out in your own handwriting. Those are possible, not advisable, but they're possible that you can uh, write that on your own. A trust document is not something that you're, you're going to uh, successfully uh, execute without uh, the benefit of legal counsel. Uh, the estate planning process, uh, again, once we get our lists, we can determine our net worth. So net worth is simply everything that you have minus your liabilities equals your net worth. Uh, if some of you all have done this, again, uh, I think a lot of people would be shocked about how much their net worth has gone up in even the last 24, 36 months, simply based on what you could get for your house uh, today. Uh, a lot of people have uh, been notified that when they go to pay their car taxes and registration, that they're going to be paying a lot more for, for the taxes on that car than they have. And that is simply because the value of used cars has also shot up tremendously. Uh, I think you need to be totally honest with yourself about what your assets are in their current uh their current uh, uh, value, uh, the amount that you owe on them uh, is generally speaking not inflationary, but it, the amount that you could that you owe uh, sometimes is very affected by the uh, interest rate that you have, whether that is a fixed interest rate or a floating or variable interest rate that matches the market. Uh, but your net worth is, is the, the difference in the two. Uh, who owns the assets and liabilities? And that is not a statement that is written to be tongue in cheek. How you title assets and to a lesser extent, uh, the liabilities uh, determine your net worth. So uh, like we talked about a minute ago, uh, the things that are held jointly might be a joint asset in life, but is not uh, an asset of yours at death. Uh, that's something to think about. Uh, three is the real meat of things. How do you want to distribute your assets? Who do you want to have help you take care of your assets? And who do you want to do the distribution? Uh, number four is a, is a big thing that I, I think people rush on. 
who do you want to manage your estate? Um, it's really interesting to me that uh, several of my cousins, uh, so my family, um, you know, that's they, family is always a great source because uh, you can kind of pick on them without really picking on them. And I use them in uh, presentations pretty frequently. Uh, but there are uh, several quarrels versus quarrels estate arguments going on right now in Franklin Circuit Court. Uh, and a lot of them are fighting about who is managing the estate. Uh, this will be my solution to that going forward and, and maybe a suggestion to you, but uh, for my will, there will be not, uh, quarrels will not be involved in managing my estate. I don't want my children uh, fighting each other over the management of it. I want it to have a, I want to have a genuine disinterested third party carve things up. And uh, I think all of you all can appreciate that. You've probably experienced it, a lot of you guys, but uh, uh, I know that with my kids, uh, just the other day, you know, splitting something in half because there's the last one. They'll each spend five minutes investigating, making sure that the other person didn't get more than half. Uh, and that I think part of that is human nature, but you can eliminate all of that by choosing somebody that's not related to you or not taking under the will. Uh, getting started, you'll need a few basic things. Um, Number one, if you've ever done a will or started estate planning, when you go to, to talk to an attorney that you pick, take a copy of that stuff with you. If there is a current will, one of the reasons that you call them a last will and testament is that literally means there could have been several wills predating that one. But the one that is valid is the very last one that was ever executed prior to death. So in that scenario, if you've got a current will and you're looking to make updates to it, gather that material together because that's already kind of what's on the books. So get that stuff. If you started in the state uh, planning journey and never actually made it across the finish line to uh, creation of wills or other documents, take all of that stuff that you've already started on and take that stuff with you. Uh, you, you've already done some effort, take the rest. Uh, number two, uh, tax returns. You, you need to have at least several years of tax returns uh, with you when you, when you uh, talk to somebody. Uh, as any prudent farmer knows, tax returns are very different than a financial statement. And tax returns and financial uh, statements sometimes need to be read together to get a accurate view of what's really going on in the farm. Uh, when, you, when you get to play games with cash accounting that are all perfectly legal, I think a lot of farmers manage for the lowest amount of tax possible and uh, may be carrying a lot of depreciation. A lot of those things are, are interchangeable with one another, but your uh, uh, person that's helping you with uh, end of life planning needs a copy of both. And then there is, again, I cannot stress this enough, get a list of all property, where it is and who owns the property, because it's very, very important. It's just a list that you have. And then once you have it, I really like keeping things on computers. I really like keeping spreadsheets. And that way, if you do sell something, you can either keep it on the spreadsheet and mark it out and write the date that you sold it and to who, um, or you can toggle it off altogether because uh, farmers are also guilty of buying and or selling a piece of equipment and then telling the other guy, well, just come get it when you feel like it. And then you blink an eye and it's still there five years later. So you can have it listed, but say, really, this piece of junk John Deere belongs to Philip Kanaka. He's just never uh, come to get it. Uh, in reviewing this stuff, part of that wheel that we talked about earlier or the treadmills, once you do get these things, if you've had changes in your life, uh, you, you need to go back and spend a few minutes on updating your financial uh, uh, position statements. 
and you need to probably take another glance at your uh, at your will. If you've had uh, a new marriage, if you've had a divorce, if you've had a birth, a death, if you're contemplating moving, if you have come into different types of assets, but they those assets are in another state, uh, possibly even a different country, uh, you need to maybe go back and, and look at your will again, because some of those things are uh, location uh, specific for how they, they're uh, passed on or taxes that are possibly due and things like that. Uh, also, again, uh, when you're reviewing this thing, if you've nominated uh, an executor, uh, every once in a while, just make sure they're still alive. If you've picked a third party in a situation like that, say, uh, you know, for whatever instance, say, you know what, that Clint Quarles guy was okay. I talked to him. I, I said, hey, would you be the executor of my will? And that person agreed. Check every few years if I'm actually alive. You, you should do that. Uh, older attorneys, if you pick one that do th this type of work, they pass away. Uh, but younger attorneys pass away as well. Uh, I have, uh, I was snoring the other day and woke up to a pillow on my face. I am very sure that my wife was do, using that as a breathing aid. Uh, so just check back every once in a while, you know, uh, a couple of years from now, if I do have a mysterious death, I'm definitely telling you all to check her out first. Uh, but make sure that I'm still alive if I'm the ex executor of your will and uh, and modify that uh, if I have passed and or are incapacitated or if moved. Uh, records and personal information. Uh, again, I'm going to get this to April and Philip and the, the other county agents on there. Uh, your attorney, when you do pick one, will have an exhaustive list uh, for you to check off. But if you're going to kind of go home tonight and get some of this stuff together or start looking for it, uh, and creating a box for it all to go into. Here's where I would start. Uh, details about the assets and liabilities. Uh, do you have a copy of the deed of your house? Do you have other real estate um, that uh, you have documents that go with that? Do you have bank accounts? Uh, do you have cash and other uh, money accounts? Provide some sort of receipt, document, something like that. Get that stuff together. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, particularly if you have moved uh, jobs or careers a lot over, over the course of your life and you've left 401ks different places, uh, come up with a list of that and think, oh man, I totally forgot that in the, uh, that in the summer of 1998, I worked at a tractor supply for six months and I, there was a stock option or a sharing plan or a 401k. A lot of people, uh, and particularly younger people, don't start a job and stick with it for the 30 years and get the gold watch. A lot of people move around and a lot of people forget about those retirement accounts uh, when they go different places, particularly if they were for small amounts of money. Uh, life insurance policies are another one. Sometimes you get those through work, uh, sometimes you get them as part of a, a group uh, that you might have been a part of. Sometimes they're required by lenders, but we get all of those life insurance uh, documents together. Any of the other things that are on there, uh, but the mortgages, notes, and money owed, again, on that list, if you do owe money, people are entitled to that when you pass away. If you have a uh, uh, record of that that makes it so much easier for the person that is distributing your things uh, after you pass away to do. They won't fight uh, the $4,200 corn bill that has come in if they see that, uh, that hey, here is uh, something where Clint bought the corn from somebody. I just hadn't paid for it yet. If they see that kind of stuff that makes uh, planning that much easier. Uh, some, a few more things, um, professionals, attorneys, and, and others really like it if you've got all this stuff 
uh, put together. The more prepared you are as a client, the better the experience will be. And uh, a lot of times it'll be cheaper. I, if I don't have to run down uh, the records and documents, and you've done it, that you've saved a lot of legwork and it goes quicker. Uh, birth and marriage records, do you, do you have a copy of that stuff somewhere? Uh, do you have uh, the names and addresses of family members and relatives uh, somewhere? Uh, that, you know, that might be funny depending on your family because, you know, some of them are just so huge and everybody knows everybody, but uh, I've seen a lot of times where uh, you're the sole survivor. You've, you've kind of outlived almost everybody. And the person that is trying to help uh, simply doesn't have the contact info for all of that. Or you pass away and your phone's locked or you've got a you know security feature on your phone. Uh, that I know you know people, but I can't access your phone to, to start notifying. So uh, keep that kind of stuff uh, out there. Uh, Christmas card list works pretty well for this as well. Name of family advisors, if you have them. For my estate planning, I've got kind of a three-person panel to help uh, sell my things and make sure that my spouse and kids get maximum value. If you've got something like that, list them, have their contact info uh, ready for whoever needs it. I like knowing where all the valuable papers are uh, ahead of time. Tell everybody where it is. Just say it's in the top of the desk or, or wherever you're keeping it. I like keeping all of this stuff in a notebook because I am kind of type A when it comes to records and things like that. Um, you can have a folder simply labeled when I die and everything's already in there uh, and it's all uh, ready to go. Your social needs to be written down at least somewhere. Uh, and then the rest of the things that are on there. One thing that I really have seen in the past that complicates things greatly is when one spouse uh, was in the military uh, a copy of any of those records, if they're already printed out, they're already there, uh, it's much easier when somebody goes and gets those things if you don't currently have a copy while they're still alive and you're not doing it on behalf of the decedent. It, it's just much, much easier. Retirement and pension plans, again, things on that list, and there's a definite reason that I'm listing them multiple times because that is super, super important. Selecting your team. Uh, Number one, I'm really going to say you, if you're going to do the work, find somebody that spends a lot of time or specializes in estate planning. Uh, I'm an agriculture attorney. I do lots and lots and lots of work for agriculture. Uh, Philip and, and some others have, have kept me busy on fence law. That's a very weird thing to become an expert in. Um, I spent a great deal of time today learning about um, uh, how you legally acquire and dispense of manure in Kentucky. That's a very specific area of law. My wife is an environmental attorney and works in Louisville with the sewer district. That's a very specific area of law. For estate planning for me, even knowing this much, I'm going to go to somebody else. If for no other reason, then they might catch something that I want. I want to find somebody that does this day in and day out, and that is their bread and butter, that this is not a side practice of theirs. So shop around. If you don't have anybody locally, you can call your local bar association if there is one. Ask an attorney that you maybe have used for something else, if they can make a, a recommendation. Back up to that is the, the Bar Association for Kentucky as the Lawyer Locator Services. Uh, on there and uh, people sometimes uh, will toggle and mention that as a practice area. Talk to friends and relatives for uh, recommendations. And the last one is something that I'm a big believer in and that's in that it's okay to interview more than one attorney. A lot of people don't do that. They will go to the very first person that they meet and they will be very impressed and it's probably a great fit and a great uh, attorney, but it is okay to say, you know what, I wanna to talk to one or two other people and call you back. It is okay, you don't need to feel pressured or boxed into a corner. A, 
an, an attorney that is good at this stuff is going to be very busy. Um, but they're, they're going to be efficient at what they do. And it's okay to wait to talk to somebody. It's okay to wait and make an appointment for when they have time to see you. And if, if it is a good fit, stay with it. And if anything causes you to think it's not a good fit, you can certainly go to somebody else. But there is nothing that obligates you from picking the, um, or sticking with the first attorney that you speak to. Uh, selecting an executor is something we'd come back to. Uh, there are a couple uh, smaller requirements. Um, I Even though they can be related, I absolutely, the older I get, I hate that. Uh, plus another, even if your kids do get along perfectly and famously, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, sometimes it's hard to have in a farm setting, but, uh, you know, you do see lots and lots of families that they get along perfectly. Even if you pick one of those, one of those kids in there, even though, you know, they do an, an outstanding, transparent and stand up job. Nomin nominating them as an executor may be for them ripping off that healing band-aid that they've created with mom or dad passing away every single time they open the mail and have another function or duty as the executor. I really don't like appointing kids, um, but that that is something um, that you can do if you feel like it. The last one is a big point in that if you have an executor in mind, actually ask them if they want to do it. Uh, a lot of people in that scenario might, might be honored or flattered that uh, you have selected them because they're, uh, you're, you're picking them based on honesty and reputation and fairness, but they just might not want to do the job. And it is great if they can tell you ahead of time, hey, I, I really, I don't have time. I don't, that's just something that I don't, don't want to do, uh, but definitely have a conversation with those people. And again, we're going to have a depth chart uh, when we go to do that. Uh, an executor can do a lot of things. Um, it can start as fast as uh, helping with the funeral arrangements, paying for that kind of stuff. If the executor needs to hire an attorney uh, to help navigate things, they can do that. Uh, they can, they start or are the face of the probate uh, uh, matters that are before the court. They put ads in the paper, they notify creditors, they can pay, depending on how things are drafted, some of those bills that we talked about that it inevitably uh, will be due. And then after some of that other stuff, they can start uh, just uh, distributing uh, household and personal uh, property. Again, I, I like uh, attorney guidance on this. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an attorney for the executor, but uh, having uh, the guiding hand of somebody who's been there before uh, sometimes makes that process much more palatable for the person that you're asking to do that. Uh, an executor is entitled to compensation unless you and your will have dictated something otherwise. Uh, the 5% has, an, has been a common uh, cap for years and years. Uh, you can actually waive other things like that in your will. You can say, hey, you're, you know, I'm capping you at this or, or whatever else you want. Or if you think somebody is entitled to more than that, um, you can make uh, de declarations or decisions like that in the will and, and ask a judge, you know, to, to approve something like that. Probably not, but the executor, the, the further they remain removed from it, I, I like that better. And frequently, if they're uh, a close friend or something like that, they, they uh, can, in the creation documents be asked to serve uh, without compensation. Sometimes people do that. Uh, other members of your team, as I mentioned, I've got a three-person panel. Uh, if you're establishing a trust, you need to, to uh, select the, the trustee. Uh, you know, the trusts are something that Keith's going to get into because they can get 
exceedingly complicated really fast. And I'm not saying that they all are, but their amount of complication directly tracks uh, how complicated or tailored your goals are that you have sat down and created. Uh, so when you've put those things together, if you have very simple goals, your trusts, if you elect that as the vehicle for carrying those out, uh, can be very, very uh, simple. Uh, sometimes even simple goals may require complicated trust. And that is something that, uh, I mean, we simply do not have time to get through all of that uh, in this sitting tonight, because I'm very cognizant about that second slide where I mentioned some of you dying during boredom uh, during this uh, presentation. I don't want that on my, on my uh, conscience. Uh, but when you, if you do uh, decide on the trust uh, as your vehicle, uh, there's some additional things that'll be required and you absolutely need an attorney to help navigate you through that. Uh, selecting somebody for your kids, that is, that is really something else. Um, that is, if you do have minor children, and I've got two of them, that is a huge consideration for you uh, and your spouse or your partner, or whoever, to sit and talk about uh, some of the things you might uh, think about or values and ethics, and maybe they have children, maybe they don't, and uh, things like that. But the court will appoint somebody if you don't. Uh, I, again, you you want to be certain that a person uh, is willing to to take on this task. Uh, I'm in a very unique situation where I only have one sibling. I have my brother. And my wife does not have uh, siblings, so it's, so it's just her. I am not positive how my brother even maintains clean clothes. Uh, he's, he stays so busy. I'm, I'm, I don't know if he has clean socks on all the time. Uh, he's just simply so busy that he, uh, doing laundry might be a challenge for him. And that might not be the best uh, guardian for the kids, uh, particularly at their stage in life. They are a they are a, uh, legally speaking, a handful. Uh, if you can hear them, they are upstairs. I'm guessing fighting each other with swords. I have no idea what they're doing. Uh, so talking to other people, friends, family members, other people may be a better fit and that sometimes that can change drastically uh, over your lifetime or over the lifetime of your children. So uh, constant reevaluation of who you think a, a proper guardian would be is something that I cannot stress enough. Planning tools that are <clears throat> that are out there that we haven't talked about uh, extensively, uh, like Keith uh, touched on last time, are these things called power of attorneys. A lot of people are familiar with these because you've had this thrust on you. Uh, power of attorneys and durable power of attorneys, they both end at death. But that, this is the document that allows you to act on somebody else's behalf. Uh, my wife is my power of attorney right now. Um, and then we've got some others kind of selected uh, if something else were to happen. Um, and, and she wasn't able to, to do that. But that allows you to pay the bills while, or it allows somebody to pay the bills on your behalf when you're in the hospital. Uh, if you're going out of the out of the state, out of country, going into a medical procedure where you might be out for a while, uh, or facing a coma or something like that, they can act on your behalf and uh, do the things that you would like them to do. Uh, durable power of attorney um, is, is more, um, as the name might suggest, is kind of a longer term or a broader concept. Uh, they're, they're generally doing a few more things. Here's a list of things there, but they can even file taxes on, on your behalf. Uh, but they really are stepping in and being you. Um, what's critical to think about when you, when you do uh, come up with a power of attorney, and this is, again, uh, this is not something where necessarily you need to be getting on the internet and just printing one off and executing it. Um, if you're going to an attorney to have your state documents put together, this is almost always something that's included in that package uh, to put that stuff together. Uh, but I, I really like having a durable power of attorney um, that's there to, to have in case you need something like this uh, done. 
uh, here are a couple of things that a, that a power of attorney cannot, and this is just things that I like to throw out uh, to people. You can always limit these things in uh, duration or limit them in purpose, but things that a, an attorney cannot do is fulfill a personal service contract. So if you, if you paid Clint Quarles to represent you in court, I can't send my power of attorney to go represent you. You hired me, not the not the other person. So they can't do that. Um, legal affidavits that require your personal knowledge. You know, Clint watched the um, car accident, and he told power of attorney Philip. Philip isn't allowed to go into into court and testify because that wouldn't make any sense. And in the same vein, if Philip was uh, asked to produce a document or a legal affidavit with, he can say, Clint told me these things, but he can't say, as Clint, I am testifying. A power of attorney cannot make a will for you. Uh, I don't think enough people understand that. Uh, if you get to the point that you are incapacitated and you have not made a will, but you somehow uh, did have the foresight to nominate and execute some documents to create a power of attorney in somebody else, that other person cannot create a will for you. That time is, has passed. And uh, a power of attorney cannot vote in an election for you. I have strangely had that question more than twice, and I put it in there. Uh, I don't know what that was about, but I, I put it in there in case you were wondering, don't be doing any voting on behalf of anybody. I think that's a pretty solid rule uh, across the board. And again, the power of attorneys um, uh, cease the moment that you assume room temperature. Uh, in doing things in that kind of same vein, uh, you can nominate somebody, a power of attorney or not, it can be, a, it can be other persons uh, to carry out your medical wishes at the end of life. This is, uh, this is something that is um, brutally personal to the person uh, that is creating it. Uh, this is something that I would absolutely talk to an attorney about. Uh, a lot of hospitals, however, have these forms or have some forms prepackaged and people just start signing away when they're in the hospital. Uh, but if we're thinking about plans and goals and things like that, let's, let's think about end of life healthcare, end of life quality of care and, um, and uh, decisions and your wishes that you want to have uh, carried out. Uh, my best friend in college, uh, his wife was a nurse and she had the best scripted and planned uh, end of life health care directive that I've ever seen. Uh, she knew what was coming. She had lupus. Uh, she fought it for a very long time and experienced the things at the end of organ failure and things like that that, that consumed her. Uh, but her health care directive was so well written and executed that I got a call and I happened to be in Lexington and close at the farm and, and close to, uh, to my friend Chad that uh, I got to, to go there and they followed her medical directive and followed uh, the uh, unplugging of machines once Chad's friends had appeared and I was one of them. And that was very powerful to me that uh, even in planning, she again knew she was going to pass and we all know we're going to pass but she also had the foresight to think uh chad needs somebody with him and she even picked who who those people were so it's a pretty powerful thing and uh, might inspire a couple of you guys to to think about that when you do think about those things get that goal together write it down and then communicate what you wish to have to everyone uh, the last thing that you want is for family members to be in full-on disputes or combat about end-of-life care um, when you're unable to speak and weigh in. Uh, you, 
there can be rifts that will uh, remain with your family forever. And it's simply because maybe one or more parties didn't understand what your end of life uh, wishes were, and some did, and they're simply seeking to carry out what you wanted, and uh, the other person is fighting them. Uh, property transfer are the things that Keith talked about last time, and I, I know we're running um, uh, I'm run monologue here for, for quite a while, uh, but you the fun thing about creating wills is you get to pick who your beneficiaries are going to be. You can pass some of those things on. You can, uh, you can do things before you die. You can do gifts. You can, um, you can uh, see the delight of not only the uh, participant's reaction to the gift, uh, but if you do a gift early enough, and to the right person, you might have the ability to literally watch somebody's life change. Uh, you can watch somebody's family tree change uh, based on, on the gift sometimes, and you get to watch that stuff uh, get, get carried out. That's a really neat thing. I'm a huge believer in gifts uh, while you're still alive. Uh, Gifting in those strategies, you need to talk to professionals when you're talking about gifts to plan for taxes and plan for taxes sometimes on both sides of that transaction. Um, <clears throat> because sometimes that, that can be a burden to at least one of the parties involved. Uh, property transfer and how you, you title things is something else that when you sit down with an attorney he or she will be able to advise you on um, not only the way your property is currently held, but maybe some strategies in terms of other things uh, and how you hold them that may be advantageous uh, to your surviving spouse and or children. Uh, wills are the maybe the, the bigger focus uh, for property transfer means uh, that this course is, is taken tonight. Um, the will, you know, I, I've come back again to, well, here's my will slide. Why do I need it? Uh, quite frankly, if, if you're an hour and a half into this and you don't think you need a will, you're probably not going to get one. But here are some other things um, that, that, uh, that the extension agents will be provided. Uh, if you need a little help and persuasion in um, maybe poking the, the person that brought you to the event tonight, if, if maybe one of you is completely on board and the other one is not, you can use this thing as the sharp pointy stick to help uh, motivate uh, your companion uh, and really, really tell them that they, they need to have a will. I can personally tell you in uh, my family, um, getting my father-in-law to actually do a will was was pretty tough. Uh, and uh, it just comes from that air of invincibility. And I think once you uh, get to the point of knowing you need a will, sometimes uh, that cloak is evaporated a little bit. Uh, I, I left on here just because I, I do teach at UK. I'm I'm fascinated with history of the law. I'm fascinating with, fascinated with legal vehicles and how wills come about, and valid wills and things like that. And that's really not something that you have to worry about because you guys are gonna be seeking out professional help and doing that. But the third one is the one that I really want to, to pound home in that an oral will, uh, even if it's videotaped or something like that, is not permitted in Kentucky. That is, that's just not a will. Uh, maybe that'll change over the course of my lifetime. Uh, I used to think 10 or 15 years ago that maybe we could have uh, recorded wills or something like that, but we're in the era of e internet deep fakes and things like that. I really do think that paper will, will be the primary vessel for wills in Kentucky forever. But as of right now, a will uh, or a recording or something like that is not uh, is not the vehicle that's going to be successful in court. Uh, 
The probate process is something your attorney will talk about. It really in, involves, in a nutshell, putting the world on notice that this person's passed away uh, and, and whatever things are owed, you better send in a, a, you know, your bill. Sometimes you might be able to, to ask for or need to ask for proof of the bill. Uh, so let's take the, the neighbor and I on the corn. Uh, if, um, if I were, if he were to pass and I sent a $4,200 bill to his spouse, she might say, well, show me some proof. Clint, I don't, uh, it's not that I don't trust you. I just need some proof of that. Well, David doesn't text. So the entire thing that I have with him has been phone calls. And if it really came down to it, that might not be a successful claim against her. Uh, text messages, uh, bills of sales, bills of lading, things like that are all important documents. But that's just, again, a way to, way to think about uh, what the probate process is. Uh, probate also involves uh, getting those lists of property and things like that together and determining the rest of the debts that are owed. But if you've already done the legwork for somebody, you will make the probate process for the executor much, much smoother. And then there are exceptions uh, to the probate process. Some property simply doesn't pass into probate. Your attorney will be better able to uh, explain the things that don't. Property transfer can also take place via a trust. A trust, the best analogy that I've ever heard for that is you're creating, there's probably two. Number one, you're creating a company. You're creating a, a company or you are giving birth to a child, a, a new thing that can, um, uh, that is got a mind and, and body of its own. But if you want to think about a trust as a business, well, you say, well, I'm creating a new business and the business is to benefit the people uh, that I want uh, to have benefited. But other than that, trusts can take any other type of shape or form, the same as different businesses might be my business is selling corn and soybeans and wheat, but other farmers might be in cantaloupes and pumpkins and uh, sweet corn. I mean, they can be lots and lots of different businesses and trusts can take lots and lots of different forms. Once you have your goals set out, you can have your uh, professionals assist you with the uh, makeup and the design of the trust. Uh, another thing that I really, I don't want to look, get too much into this tonight because I know Keith's going to talk about this specifically, but uh, I get lots of uh, questions about Medicare and Medicaid look back. And Keith did talk about that the first time or on the first um, uh, part of the seminar. Uh, you, This is something that is very real and a very... Uh, big thing to talk about. So when you get these documents and materials put together, uh, your tax professional will be able to help you look at how far back Medicare or Medicaid would like to uh, look at those transactions and possibly undo them to uh, help pay their bill. Uh, home health care, adult daycare, uh, that kind of stuff. I have numbers, kind of hard numbers up to through 2016 that were vetted. I don't know that you could get uh, a private room in a nursing home for $84,000 a year now. Uh, that might be well into the 120s if that is even at $10,000 a month. Uh, you see that second column of five-year annual growth at 2%. I don't think that uh, with the with the inflationary environment that we're in right now, that any costs will be capped at 2%. Uh, ask any farmer that's in the room with you, I would love to pay just 2% more for inputs than I paid this time last year. Uh, I bought chemicals prior to the first of the year for five times what I paid for them last year, and I was very happy to get them simply because I don't think that there's going to be any else out there. Nursing homes and medical care uh, don't necessarily um, uh, track the inflation or inflationary indexes. Uh, so some of these things that I have on there are, are pretty old. 
uh, the five-year look-back period might not be a set five years. Cost of nursing home, I think, is much more than $75,000, and that's getting into uh, levels and standards of care and whether or not you have a roommate. Uh, and that's uh, kind of exclusive of other medical care and or uh, prescriptions and, and doctor visits and things like that that your loved one may have. I, I also get um, long-term care insurance questions frequently. And there are some uh, general guidelines on that. I'm not an insurance salesman. Uh, but that is definitely a different tool that uh, when you're planning and doing your goals, you should plan for the possibility of incapacitation or needing uh, some sort of long-term care, and you start shopping those policies. This is one where policies are not uniform. You really need to shop what you're, what you're buying there. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll be getting these slides uh, to fill up uh, uh, in April. Uh, Long-term care, here are some other numbers um, in there. There was a projection at that time what they would cost. Um, I, I really wanted to get some 2020 numbers on this uh, because when I was doing these a lot more frequently back in uh, 2017 and using 2016 numbers, we were thinking, oh, wow, you know, 20 years from now, it might cost 135000 as opposed to 75000 I bet that we're there uh, right now, maybe for the average uh, for the average person, and it sure didn't take 20 years. Uh, you know, the 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 value of money is is changing rapidly, and the cost of things are as well. Uh, additional resources, I'll have this stuff uh, available and links that are available. These are resources for you to. Uh, help guide your process or to help go about uh, uh, the planning. These things are your uh, digital or printed Sherpas for that, for that uh, journey. These things though, once you start down this path, that's not enough. What, what is enough is seeing it through and, uh, and going to, to uh, going to the end with it. Now I'm about to stop sharing so I can get to the chat room uh, there. And uh, I think uh, I think that I'm here and now I've, uh, I'll have, I'll, I'm gonna open this up and start answering uh, questions from the uh, chat box if, if that's the format you wanna take, April. Uh, yep. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, there are several. Uh, let's, uh, Nancy Montgomery, you should wave your hand so everybody can see. Oh heavens! I don't know where I am. Uh, I know. I'm, I'm just. I was joking. It's a. It's a. It's a black screen with your name on it. Uh, but we'll we'll pretend you're waving. Uh, Nancy, <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, if you do have a current will, so Nancy, let's say that you went through the process, and uh, and you did everything, and you think that your will is just really good but one of those things happened on that list, right? One of, maybe we had a, a new addition or a change of mind about one thing or the other. Uh, you're saying, can I just make like a, a PS note on it or a small amendment, correct? Yes. Okay, you think, man, that Clint guy gave a good presentation. I would really like to mention him in my will. Number one, I am very pro that. I would love to be mentioned in your will. Uh, what you can execute is something called a codicil. A, a codicil in Kentucky is essentially that PS note uh, at the bottom of the will. It is, uh, it's an amendment that doesn't go and shake up the entire will. It is simply a small uh, or a, an amendment um, it was kind of contemplated to be smaller in, in size. It, it can be of any size you want, but it is an amendment to the original will. Nancy, however, when you do have a codicil, when you take the steps, legal steps, to make sure that your codicil is going to be viable or legally would withstand any scrutiny in court, 
you have to meet all of the other requirements for a valid will. So I think if you do have an amendment, unless it's a small amendment, uh, Nancy, I would I would just use that opportunity for a complete will review and uh, go back and probably talk to your uh, talk to your uh, preparer uh, and tell them about the change you need. This is okay. not a this is not a typewriter document anymore. Um, you know, I, I'd say Keith or any of the other uh, attorneys that, that you'd want to ask the question to. We're hoarders. I'm going to keep, I'm going to have a digital um, or word version of your will that I had already done. So amending that thing will be very, very fast. Uh, it won't require uh, completely starting over. But okay, it, might be, it might be a time to start over in your review uh, when you have that, though. Uh, and then... Uh, the next question that I see here is from Chris. Uh, how do you handle planning when you have young children who might be interested in farming but don't really know yet? Is there a way a trust might be a good way to go on this? Yes, Chris, absolutely. And Chris, just to, to hijack your question, uh, I was doing one of these talks with uh, Steve Isaacs a number of years ago, and, and I kind of made this this comment, and he's uh, taken it and run with it. Uh, guys, if you all have farms, and I'd say that there's a fair number of, of farm owners on the list or on in the viewing areas tonight, have you had an honest conversation with your children about whether or not they want the farm? And I'm being very serious when I when I say that. A lot of kids may want the farm, but they are not interested in being farmers. They like the land, maybe they'd like the home place, maybe they'd like the place to go back to, uh, but they're not necessarily interested in inheriting a job. Or if they inherited the farm, it might look radically different than how you have run it. So if these are things, number one, I, I would just ask the children if they want the farm. Uh, children are also going to be frequently very dutiful to their parents and say, well, of course, mom and dad, I want that. Uh, what they might want is the dollar value that uh, the farm uh, may have uh, sold to somebody else. But I think having very frank conversations uh, with any of your children, and I'm talking about children that are uh, of, of any age. Uh, I just remember, uh, you know, some of the estate sales that I've ever gone to, uh, you know, growing up, but I, I distinctly remember one uh, in the, is either the late eighties or early nineties. And I went to the estate sale and, and the older gentleman had passed away. And I think he was in his early nineties and uh, his sons were there. Uh, at the estate sale. And I think jokingly, one of the sons said, well, I'm finally going to get to drive the tobacco setter. And I thought that that was the funniest thing that I'd ever heard because at nine years old, I would, you know, I was never going to drive the tobacco setter. I, I was uh, several decades off uh, from getting that uh, opportunity. But having a frank conversation about whether or not they want the farm and then viewing the farm and farming differently is, um, is, a, is, a, is a pretty big concept. And you need to be brutally honest with yourself and your spouse about that and your goals. And you need to be brutally honest with your children and ask them to have that same respect for uh, honesty that you do. Chris, your actual question of, will the, the children might be interested in farming is a trust a good way to go? Uh, trusts are something that I really like, especially with children. Um, with children, I, I don't like seeing things that the moment they turn 18, that they get everything. Uh, sometimes uh, metering that out a little bit. Uh, you are probably, Chris, a very different person at 30 as you were at 18. Uh, and if you want trusts uh, to help slow things down or slow a, 
teenage boy down trusts are a good vehicle uh, to do that. Children also don't don't really know if they like farming. Uh, that's that's uh, something that that I don't think that we talk about enough in agriculture. And it's kind of neat because I do other talks of this nature, but to other attorneys. And uh, as an agriculturalist, uh, you know, I grew up on Alice Chalmers tractors. I am still, uh, I think that stupidity was bred into me, literally. Uh, Philip grew up with John Deere tractors, but even as, as little boys uh, at Christmas, you know, we're given toy tractors and, and toys of farm equipment and, and toys of little trucks. And so I think that our family's professions are pushed onto us in agriculture at a very young age. Uh, at this point in life, my wife and I are both attorneys, but, uh, you know, for our children at Christmas, I'm not giving them pens and legal pads. You know, I'm not really pushing that uh, on them uh, quite at the same rate that we do in, in farming. Uh, so here, yes, trusts could be a very useful tool, but you also know your own child and your own child's um, inclinations and habits far better than I do. But I would still write down your goals and see if, um, see if, if uh, trusts are something that would be uh, in the toolbox for your preparer. And then uh, we just got another one in, and I realize I'm getting uh, kind of late here, but Julie W. wants to know, my husband and I have one son. He's grown with kids of his own. If I die first, my husband will get the family farm. Well, uh, as we noted earlier, um, if you die without a will, your, your husband will get half of your estate. Uh, a curious thing in Kentucky is you, you cannot use a will to override the surviving spouses getting half. You can't cut them out by will. Uh, if you uh, pass before your spouse, they'll be entitled to half of your assets either way. But you're saying my husband will get the family farm. If he marries again, his new wife could end up with it if my husband dies first. Yes, that is uh, that is at least a possibility through either the laws of intestacy or um, or a will. How do I make sure a new wife and her children, if she has any, do not end up with half of my family's farm? Should I set up a trust? Oh boy, I. Uh, Julie, is your husband there with you at the uh, at this planning event? Because that could be a fun ride home, let me tell you. Uh, oh, all right, he knows. Well, good. Uh, uh, in this situation, Julie, uh, these are things that when you sit down and do your um, list that you're putting together and you put down your goals, um, this is something that you need to have a very specific talk to the attorney that you select about. Uh, there's there are a couple different theories on this. Number one, I am probably very sure that your husband will make sure that it kind of stays as that family farm and stays with blood, uh, if that is something that was important to you guys. Uh, there, uh, there are um, methods that might allow you to plan for that a little, little more closely. Uh, that also could be something where how it's titled uh, could make a difference. A trust is one vehicle that people frequently uh, partake in to ensure that it stays in somebody's family. I've, uh, I'm part of a family that has been on the same piece of dirt in Franklin County for a couple hundred years. I completely understand the, the value of um, of that and of to people. Uh, the other side of that, Julie, and to anybody else, is the concept of after I die, how long sh or how 
much should I control something after I pass away? And that's something that I've struggled with, uh, at least internally on and off uh, over the years. Uh, my wife and I, uh, to give you all a little bit of background, uh, I am a full-time attorney. Uh, I teach at UK uh, one night a week and have done that for 16 years. And when we're not doing that, we farm a uh, thousand acres or so in Scott and Fayette County. So I, I commute one way uh, or an hour one way every day. So, so I farm, I, I do this stuff. Uh, we were lucky enough to buy 90 acres in Fayette County, right on the Scott and Fayette County line. And at first, I thought, well, man, you know, we've worked so hard. I wouldn't ever want my kids to sell that. And I had ping-ponged back and forth between setting up a trust, making that something that they can't sell. And then more recently, I've settled into, uh, man, if, if I'm gone, sell it, go take the money, go be happy, do, do whatever you want. I, I don't know what life will look like in a few years or what reality will look like. Um, but if preservation and a last name going with land is, is something critical uh, in the goal making um, uh, portion of the process, I would absolutely discuss the options available with the attorney. Uh, a, a trust is certainly a document that you can use. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if does anybody else have questions or April or Philip? Uh, do you guys have anything or any other notes or the uh, counties that do have viewing parties? Uh, do any of you guys have any questions? I do not have um, anything that's came into me. So, um, if anyone does have anything um, that you think of after we get off the chat tonight, please let us know. Uh, I can get them to Clint and he can answer them or we can uh, check with Keith on his next presentation as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're both wonderful assets that we can reach out to and get answers from as well. So Clint, we thank you so much for uh, presenting this evening. It was a lot of great information. I know I've told the, the group before that we've learned the hard way in my family with um, my mamaw and then my father-in-law as well. So there's a lot to do with a lot of stuff. So we greatly appreciate you. Um, and if I have anything, I'll let you know. And then also we'll, um, as soon as you send the PowerPoint over to me, I'll get it out to everybody as well. And um, any questions too, so. Well, April, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, that All of those examples that I just gave you guys about my children and them uh, surviving me, absolutely forget all about it. I was just hit by a Nerf bullet. Uh, they just uh, snuck down and did that. So I won't have any errors uh, here in a few minutes. Uh, thank you guys uh, so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, you guys uh, are in absolutely great hands uh, with Keith uh, for the uh, remaining uh, balance of the, of the uh, series. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you, Clint. And for everybody, we'll see you um, next time. Our next date is February the 10th, and it is the wills and power of attorney. So be thinking of questions ahead of time, because I think Clint did a great segue into what to expect the next time. So it may jar your brain to go ahead and pre prepare a few questions um, that you can ask Keith during that one. So we'll see you February 10th. You'll get emails from me with, with follow-up stuff from tonight, and then also for reminders for the ones coming up. So good night, everybody. Take care and be safe.